I'm not going to bore you with PSC stuff because that's not really why you're here. You know, the big off from everybody, right? No, and I want to thank Claxton. I actually got to meet Claxton in, during my service on the Republican State Central Committee. Claxton is a, a really bright, shiny light. You know, I love it to listen to the Democrats call Republicans racist because I think they're all full of beans. And I think that it shows that the Republicans have a, the Republicans have a big tent. We're not uh, anything other than looking forward to embracing all of our conservatives in Louisiana and in the country. And like Claxton said, uh, the, you know, uh, what folks were uh, on before, they are simply drawn to the, the perpetuation of voting for Democrats because that's the way it's always been. But now, what we're looking at now is that uh, a turn in the African-American community from uh, the men uh, moving towards voting for Trump. I think we've got, we're now crossing into that 18 point line, and it's gonna make a big difference this election. Uh, Hispanic males, uh, African-American males, and I think that you're gonna see a, a decided chance. And I see, uh, is that Senator Guillory in the back? Yes. Is that my buddy? There he is. Senator Guillory and I always have a contest to see who can find out where it is on each other. So there you go. So anyway, but look, I want to tell you, the first thing I want you to do is uh, make a notation in your paperwork or on your phone, TrumpForce47.com. I'm the co-chairman of the Donald Trump campaign for Louisiana. I was uh, co-chairman in uh, 2019, and I was chairman in 2006, well, 2015, until he got the nomination, and then there were a lot of co-chairmen. So it was, just, it was just me and Donald in the back of the room until uh, he got the nomination, and then all of a sudden, everybody's got a friend, right? But he's been a great uh, leader, and he's actually really stepped up for Louisiana. And I want you to know, I, I had a, a giant moment of deja vu the other day when uh, the poor folks over in Georgia and in North Carolina, when I saw Donald Trump get on his plane and fly over there to see what he could do to lend support, if, if nothing but uh, moral support for the victims of Hurricane Lee. In 2015, when we had the rains and floods up in East Baton Rouge and Livingston Parish, I uh, got on the phone, called the campaign, and I told uh, the folks that we needed President Trump to come in uh, to visit with us. And President Trump, at the time, was Candidate Trump. Candidate Trump, Candidate Pence, both flew into Baton Rouge. Uh, we went all through uh, Baton Rouge, uh, Livingston, we met with uh, Reverend Graham, we met with Tony Perkins. Uh, we had a private meeting at uh, Tony Perkins Church with a group of volunteers who came in to work and help folks out. And uh, it was interesting to see, without any media there, the volunteers coalesced around Donald Trump and asked him if they could pray with him. And, they formed a circle in the room, they put hands on each other, and they prayed. And it was a moment for me, um, I was really taken back, and saw that at that moment, I just, you know, you knew that there was something there. It was not an empty suit. And when we got back in the car, we were riding back to the airport, and at that time, my executive assistant got a text message uh, from someone, and understanding that when we left the airport, drove to Denver Springs and back, there was not a square inch of the road that did not have somebody on it waving at Donald Trump, waving signs, whatever they could. And so what was particularly interesting was uh, the text message that came through was, today was the day that Donald Trump became president. And to that moment, it actually did happen that way. And you know, from that point forward, Hillary Clinton, uh, was to say, well, I'm not going to come to Louisiana because I don't want to get in the, in the way of the recovery. And earlier today, I was uh, listening to someone up at the North Shore Tea Party event making note that they were so impressed at that moment. It was the head of the, uh, tea, the Cajun Navy. He was talking about, I was there when Donald Trump was unloading a truck with supplies and they were trying to make it look like, a, uh, they said they were trying to make it look like a press event. I said, I got the photograph of Donald Trump handing me the box and telling me to hand it to the guy behind me. And I actually have it framed in my office. So we actually, he, and it's not just he unloaded the supplies. Donald Trump sent a tractor trailer of supply to supplies to Denham Springs, and we pre-positioned it 
And so he donated it and we unloaded it and it was not anything like the press said. So you can always have faith in the press to get it wrong. That's the important thing. So uh, the other thing is that uh, it's nice to know that Kamala Harris hates MAGA because it's just saying make America great again. And the last thing that Kamala Harris wants to do is make America great again. So as long as you remember that, you know what kind of person she is. Kamala Harris also says that her, her values haven't changed. And she said that. And so, um, you know, she said that she was not opposed to fracking. She's not, you know, she supports the police. She wants a stronger border, etc. But she also said after a video show that Kamala Harris was anti-fracking, anti-police, anti-border, anti-Second Amendment, anti-private freedom. So what should we believe? What, what, what should concern each and every one of us is that ultimately Kamala Harris's values actually haven't changed. She's still the rooted leftist, socialist, Marxist, and anti-American she always has been. Now, as a person largely raised in Canada, under the influence of a dysfunctional parent set who are art and Marxists, she couldn't be anything less than anti-American and dedicated to changing America into a system which would be nothing more than a servant to our primary communist enemy nation in the world, actually in the world, and that would be China. Now, do you really believe that she picked Tim Walz for any other reason but his extreme interest in interconnectivity with China and his fascination with Mao's Little Red Book? His Little Red Book of Revolution, that every time he went to China and made a report back to one of his students that he would buy as many as 30, small, 30 copies of the Little Red Book and bring it back to disseminate here in the United States to his students to influence them. And I have a friend of mine who's from China who was taken out of college during that revolution, put on a farm, uh, dragging a water buffalo in a rice paddy because he was determined to be too much of an intellectual and sent for re-education. And so he was one of the 80 million people that happened not to get killed. So he doesn't think too much of Tim Walz, nor does he think too much of Kamala Harris in their little red book. So I think we should face it that Tim is the poster child for a knucklehead American student who's easily influenced by communist overlords. And I think they found their Manchurian candidate. So truly, Kamala Harris is actually a fascist. She's an autocrat, a traitor, dysfunctional, and a danger to the nation. And she makes her communist running mate, Tiananmen Tim, pale in comparison. Now we all know Susan Rice, the power running Biden, who warns of mass expulsion under Ameri of American citizens under a Trump administration. And remember, she's nothing but a liar. Not only would it not happen, as it didn't happen during the previous Trump term, and it would seem that it's some sick fascination of leftists projected. And it's more likely that it would be an effort of the left to figure out a way to expel American citizens that they didn't like. The Biden-Harris administration is delusional and detestable, repeatedly calling Trump a threat to democracy, despite two separate overt assassination attempts. They, couldn't, they continue to provoke the mentally marginal population to try and get them to attack by restating the spurious lie that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. It would be laughable if it wasn't so dangerous. Actually, what, they, what I hate the most about this, and what they hate the most about this, is that Donald Trump loves America, Donald Trump loves the Constitution, and Donald Trump, above all, loves freedom. Now, recently we see where MSNBC was caught during an undercover investigation, where they call, they found out that we call, they call the Harris campaign every morning to discuss the, and obtain the talking points so they can support the Harris campaign. So it further proves that the, you know, the whole buy-in from the legacy media and their influence from what I perceive to be a cash-based element is there to help the Harris campaign and why you cannot rely on the legacy media. You're going to have to get it from non-traditional uh, news sources to at least get some semblance of real media and real accuracy. Now, moving on. The United States spends in excess of about $59 billion to support just a few foreign nations. And recently, 
we finding out that the United States spends about $9,000 per illegal alien in the United States. And that alone is about $90 billion under the estimate of how many uh, illegals are in this country now. And in fact, could be as high as $180 billion. And yet, the struggle of the United States now is to provide $750 for each victim of Hurricane Helene. And that's for the ones who manage to get to a computer, manage to register, and manage to obtain the funds. And this does not include the ones who are stuck in a mountaintop with no way to get to a computer, much less food, water, and medical attention. Now, instead of providing full funding to FEMA or its intended purposes as an emergency management agency under the Stafford Act, money is illegally being diverted to the border to clear illegal aliens into this country in large volumes. Now, during the Camilla Harris recent visit to the border in her combat coat and her $70,000 Tiffany necklace, information was provided to the press showing how 400,000 plus convicted criminals have been allowed into this country over the border. In addition, 15,000 of those are convicted of sex crimes. And even worse, in excess of 13,000 are convicted murderers. Those convicted felons were led into this country and are moving openly through our society, fully funded by our government through FEMA, instead of that money helping our citizens ravaged by Hurricane Helene. Now look, I don't want to go all Henry V on you, but you, <laughs> but you should rage, and rage against the government that's failing you. Rage against this over-incompetence. Each of you should write your congressman, your senator, and demand that they seek appointment of a special counsel and investigate and prosecute Alejandro Mayorkas. Now certainly, if a storm takes a victim, we consider it an act of God. But every person who dies after the storm because of a failure of FEMA to provide relief because it shifted money off to a questionable activity, their death should be considered a homicide. And it is even more clear that the person who's at the top of the agency should stand trial over this issue. Such criminal behavior is outrageous. It's traitorous, it's barbaric, and it's un-American. Well, I've had enough of leftist Democrats making false accusations regarding anything that they can think of being perpetrated by any Republican for any reason. All, I, all of it for the purpose of election interference and driving a person's reputation down. Well, consider this quote from Karl Marx. Accuse your enemy of what you are doing, and you're doing it to create confusion. I think our little friends are from the left are doing what Mr. Carl's advice was exactly to the T. It's almost like they're following the Bill Clinton playbook. Deny everything, but even Slick Willie didn't walk around just spewing lies until he got caught. Every day on the corrupt news, the opposition continues to spew lies about the Republican Party and its candidates. And at this point, it should be easy to convince you that not only do leftists project, but they're also doing as part of a concerted effort to take advantage of Marxist mechanisms to affect control over the population for government. Now, the Biden-Harris administration has demonstrated their willingness to suppress the freedoms of our Americans and our nation. Recently, Mr. Zuckerberg freely admitted, well, not really, but after extreme pressure, <laughs> freely admitted that the Biden-Harris administration coerced Meta to censor the content of American citizens on social media. And more support for that concept was the recent statements of former Senator John Kerry, Mr. Heinz, clearly revealing his distaste for the impediments that are put in place by the First Amendment of our Constitution that protect our freedoms to express our free expression. Now, it's been widely shown in the media that Kamala Harris and Tim Walz believe in socialism. Kamala was universally known in the Senate as the most leftist member, left burning. Now, you have to remember that she was raised in an upper-income family of two university professors who were dedicated Marxists. The nut did not fall far from the tree. Now, Harris Wall's administration would work diligently to further separate the root faith of our nation and place us further 
into a country that puts its faith in government and not God, as that's the goal of socialism. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. In the New World Order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of our schools, universities, churches, and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. Now, replacing our faith in God with the socialist need for our faith in the all-powerful state. Now, their mantra will be to hell with your God, to hell with your feelings, and you must worship the state. Now, this is not a new concept. In 1891, Pope Leo XIII said that socialism acts against natural injustice and destroys the home. It must utterly be rejected by Catholics. And I think we've seen that manifested since the Great Society, where we see the breakdown of our culture, the breakdown of families, and as the socialism aspect and the uh, way that we've been handling our public uh, payments in the society have broken down families and made more families as individual citizens dependent on the government versus having families work together as well. In later years, Pope Pius XI in 1931 stated that religious socialism or Christian socialism are contradictory terms and that no one can be at the same time a good Catholic and a true socialist. But if we look at the roots of socialism, it all goes all the way back to Henry, Saint, Henry D. St. Simon in the late 1700s, where he sought to create a dividing line between those who were just people who were idle and people who worked. And so he came up with this idea and he created the term working class. And the working class was going to be separated from the idle class. It wasn't about idle rich, it was just people who were just not working. And from this obscure Frenchman became the building blocks that were the formative or formative of a class-based society that was further espoused, uh, espoused by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the fathers of modern communism. Now, the concept of class differentiation is anti-American. We have to look at different differences in our country based on anything of income. Certainly, there are people with upper incomes, middle incomes, and less income. But no one is superior by class. The nation struggled through revolution to eliminate them from our culture. Now truly, socialism is a, it has a hidden construct in which it's about creating a super class of elites, which shall control what it perceives to be everyone else. We cannot let this be our nation on a tilt. Now just remember what Kamala Harris has said. My values haven't changed. Once a Marxist socialist, always a Marxist socialist. Remember, TrumpForce47.com, you can sign up to do phone calls, you can sign up to get signs and distribute, you can sign up to do walking, you can be a neighborhood captain, you can host a party, and it's T-R-U-M-P-F-O-R-C-E, the number four, the number seven, dot com, and this is gonna be the most important election that we face probably ever because it is going to be a sea change in how we look forward to what someone who we thought was going to do damage with executive actions like Joe Biden, to someone who's got a major plan to do sea change by executive order to eliminate the filibuster, to stack the Supreme Court, to do everything that they can think of to change the dynamic of what they want to do to our country, including, as she said, a mandatory buyback of firearms, of which they could order, and then we would have to fight for it. So this is everything in this, everybody in this room looks like they've hit the seasoned age of grandchildren and maybe even great-grandchildren. And I'm going to tell you that you're not fighting for yourself anymore. You're fighting for your descendants. And you're also fighting for the Constitution, and you're fighting for freedom. So go ahead and wear the badge of MAGA on your sleeve, because if you'd like to make America great again, I think you're in good company. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come speak to you. That was excellent.
Now you see what I was talking about before, why he's not only a great public service commissioner, but he's great for our community.